Listen, so we're in a series called Concrete. Somebody say Concrete. And so what that is, is that we are establishing the culture of the house. And after this week, we will have three more weeks of concrete and then we're going to transition out. But somebody, some of y'all might be thinking like, man, like, like we've been in this series for a long time. But, but the th- has this been good to y'all? It's part, great, great. Because what we're doing is we're establishing the culture of this house. Um, and it's good because we're building or we're setting the building blocks of who we are. And, and if I can just be honest with you, one of the reasons why this series means so much to me is because I am a culture enthusiast. Like, I, I'm, I'm a leadership enthusiast. And it's important that we set these standards because one thing that is essential to know is that culture can only be taught and then it is enforced. You cannot enforce something that you have not taught first. You cannot hold somebody accountable to something that has not been communicated. And so what we're doing is we're teaching this, and it is important, hear me on this, it is important that we make sure that we set the standard of the culture of our church. Now, I said standard and not goal. Some of us need to even change our, 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 the way we speak because we set goals about things, and goal is something that you, ho- that, you, uh, that you hope to achieve. A standard is the bottom line. That is a non-negotiable. So for some of us, we need to say, it is the standard of my life that I work hard. I'm not going to try to work hard. It is the standard. So anytime that I get outside of that, I'm out of order. We have to set standards in our life because what that does is it sets the foundation. Somebody say foundation. So hear me on this. We are continuing our series today, and we're going to go into something that is really, really important to me, and I can tell you it's extremely important to our church, and that is the next generation. Slap the person next to you and say the next generation. So we're going to be teaching on this today. Let me pray, and then we're going to preach. Y'all ready? Y'all ready? Let's go, Heavenly Father. We thank you so much for today. We thank you for this time. We ask that you bless this service. Bless everybody, person. Uh, bless every person in here, God. I pray that that Father God, that you would touch our hearts, that you would open our hearts. I pray that you would speak through me. Let me decrease so that you might increase. God, be in the room and let us see transformation in Jesus' name. And we all say. Amen. So I'm not going to start off with an anchor verse because we have a few verses that we're going to walk through, but I want to actually start off with a story that I was told and it was about a little boy. And so there's a little boy who grew up um, here um, in Houston. And, and, and what happens is, is that he he grew up um, and his parents were divorced. And in the midst of that, um, his parents introduced him to Jesus, but he didn't necessarily have a church home, right? He didn't have a church home where he attended consistently. And sometimes he'd go to church with his mom. Sometimes he'd go to church with his dad. And I'll never forget that this person told me that, um, that this little boy one day that he was driving with his dad um, up the street and that there was a new construction site that was, that was being built. And every time that his dad and him would drive by there, they'd talk about, I, they, I wonder what it's going to be. Keo, they drive by and his little kids say, man, dad, I don't know what that's going to be. What do you think it is? You think it's going to be a building? You think it's going to be another school? I wonder if it's going to be a Popeye's, right? Nobody <laughs> knew what it was going to be. And then one day they saw a sign going on the outside and that sign said it was going to be a church. And so we looked and, 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 and so he looked at his dad and he said, one day we'll go and visit. We'll go and pick We'll, we'll go and check it out. And so the, the service goes and, and the father and the son, they, they go to this church and, and, and the boy likes the church, but he was in a big church. So it wasn't really everything that he loved. And then they saw on the announcements that it said Friday night black party for all the kids. So this little kid looked at his dad. And he said, yeah, you can go. So every Friday they would have these, um, these black parties where the kids from all around the city, that they would come and, and they had basketball courts, they would give out free food, that they would have arcade games, they would have these things and this boy ended up going there and before he fell in love with the church, he fell in love with the black party. He fell in love with the outreach and then from there that boy gave his life to Jesus and there that boy um, got baptized and from there he made a decision that he was gonna give his life to Christ. That boy ended up planting a church one day, and that boy is me. Pastor Matt, why do you start off telling this story? Because I am passionate about sowing into the next generation. I am a product of a church caring about the future just as much as they care about the present. I'm a product of pastors who looked and saw a community and saw a need and said, we're not just going to have a great Sunday but we're going to make sure that we have something for the kids throughout the week. That I'm a product of people thinking just beyond this generation and going to the next generation. And if God is concerned with that, we should be concerned with it too. So when I talk about this is that it is important that, that we understand this. So, you know, every, every week we have a big idea. Somebody say big idea. 
we have a big idea. So if you're taking notes, you need to write this down because this is our big idea for the next generation. And this is what it is. We prioritize the next generation now. Somebody say now. We prioritize the next generation now because we have to be forward thinkers here at Blueprint. We are innovators and we're concerned with the future. And all throughout the Bible, hear me on this, our first scripture's coming up. All throughout the Bible, God speaks about how we're supposed to raise up the next generation. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 9, it says this, And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly. That means not divided. You must be committed to it with everything that you have, wholeheartedly, with everything you got, to these commands that I'm giving you today. Number 7 says this, Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house gates. Listen to this. If you were here last week, you remember that we actually went into Deuteronomy 6 when we were talking about worship. If you knew this, that in, you can leave that verse up. In verse 5, right before it, that's where it says to love the Lord, your, uh, your God. It says, Hero Israel, the Lord your God is one. To love him with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. And then verse 6 is where he says, and you must commit yourself wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today that God was speaking to Moses. They were about to get into the promised land. All of these things that we discussed, the Israelites have been on journey for 40 years and they're about to get into the place and God begins to give them commands on how they're supposed to move and what they're supposed to do. And after he tells them, that, the first thing he says is that the Lord your God is one and you're to love him with all your heart, your mind, and your soul. And the second thing he says is repeat it to your children. The second thing, the first instruction that he gives them after he gives them the command is make sure that you repeat it to your children. Why, Pastor Matt? Why? I'm glad you asked. Because God knew that if we don't teach them, somebody else will. If you do not write Proverbs, Solomon says it like this in Proverbs, train a child up in the way that they should go. And that when they get older, they shall not depart. This is the thing. God was saying that you are about to go into the land that I've given you. Verse, uh, verse 11 said this. It says, when you go into the land and you eat your fill. Y'all remember we talked about this last week? That, that when you get to the place that I've set aside for you, when you get to the place that I've commanded to you, make sure that you do not forget about me. Why? Why? He wasn't just talking to him. He was talking to the generations. He was talking to the people that would come before them. He says, repeat this again and again, that you're going to go into a land. Let's say it like this, that the next generation is going to be watching YouTube all day. Make sure you repeat to them again and again. That hey, Even for us, that we're going to be exposed to so many different ideologies and thought processes. Make sure that you repeat it again and again, that God even gave them instructions. He says, talk about them when you're at home. And when you're on the road, make sure that you're, that, that you're preaching to them, that you're talking about the goodness of God. You're talking about the laws and the statutes of God when you're home. Even when you're on the road, don't ever let it be a place. Don't ever let it be a position that you're not pouring into them. And this is the thing right here. What he's saying is that you can't just try to be their friend. You have to make sure that you teach them. Come on, y'all. That, that, that you don't just need to look for their agreement. You need to, you need to be a model for their ascension. You have to make sure that, that, you, that, that, that you just don't try to make them like you, but you have to make sure that you love them with truth and train them up in the way they should go. You should repeat to them. Some of y'all be saying, Pastor Matt, I'm not a parent. But there are people, and there are the next generation. They don't have to be toddlers. They don't have to be children. But there are people that are younger than you that are the next generation that you have influence and leadership over, and they're looking to you on how to go. You always have eyes on you. Oh, Pastor Matt, I'm not a pastor. You have eyes on you. Pastor Matt, I'm not a father yet. You have eyes on you. Pastor Matt, I'm, I'm, I'm not a mother yet. You have eyes on you. Some of us pride ourselves on being, on being a rich auntie. You have eyes on you. You always have eyes on you. And he's telling them, if you don't teach them, somebody will. You're going to go into the land. In the book of Judges, he sits there and tells them, he says, because you have neglected me, I will remove my hand and your generations will be tempted with all the other gods in the land. Because you didn't cover them, there'll be 
covered by somebody else. Because you didn't teach them about God, they now refer to him as the universe. Because you didn't teach them about how he's a healer and he's a provider, now they look at rocks and sage to make their house peaceful. Because you didn't set the example, you let the rappers set the example. Because you didn't keep the word flowing. Ooh, some of y'all getting deep. I know it. Because we didn't keep the word flowing, you let the words of the song disciple them themselves. Repeat to them over and over again to your children. You're going to be exposed to so many other things. They're going to be exposed to so many other things. We were exposed to so many other things. We're talking about the next generation. And hear me on this. We all have an investment in this. I just said that, that this is the standard of blueprint. This is not just to the individual parents in the room, but this to us collectively as a church. And if you are in the kingdom, it should be your priority. Because they say that it takes a village. And hear me on this. We are the village. As a church... We are the village. So we see this in here that God consistently tells us to raise up a generation because God is a generational God. See, it is us in America and Western civilization that we often only talk about ourselves. It's me, myself, and I. That's all I got in the end. That's what I found out. I almost sang it too. She discipling something. Never mind. Um, uh, so we serve a generational God. I almost got off track. That's the ADHD right there. So... The thing is, is this, is that it is us that often gets caught, caught up in the idea that it's just about us. But, it, but, but, but in um, Judaism, in, in Eastern or ancient Near Eastern culture, that we see that God consistently spoke about generations. That God did not just speak to the person, but he spoke to the generation. Let's go to Genesis 17. This is the conversation that we see. One thing that I love about the Bible is that we get to eavesdrop on conversations that we should not have been a part of. That we didn't have the privilege to be in. And this is where we get wisdom from. We see that God is having a conver uh, conversation with a man called Abraham. He, well, his name was Abram and God changed his name to Abraham. And here, this is what he says. I will confirm my covenant with you and your descendants after you. From generation to generation, this is the everlasting covenant. So verse 7, he starts off saying that, listen, I'll confirm it. He said that I'll make you the father of many nations, that your descendants will be, will, will be as numerous as the sand. And verse 7 says, I will confirm my covenant with you, but not just with you. I'll confirm it with your descendants after you from generation to generation. This is an everlasting covenant. It does not stop. I will always be your God. And the God of your descendants after you, verse 8 says this, and I will give the entire land of Canaan where you live now as a foreigner to you and your descendants, and it will be their possession forever. And I will be their God. Let me tell you this right here. God is having this conversation, and he's saying that, listen, that, that I'm confirming a covenant with you. I'm speaking it to you, but it's not just for you. It's for the generations that come after you. Can I bless you real quick? The thing is, is this, is that we talk about often that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jacob and Isaac had not even been born yet. And God was speaking a promise over their life just to their grandfather. Do you know that God could be speaking something to you that should last for generations? That... So y'all don't know when to shout about that. Because the thing is, is this, is that God, the covenants and the confirmations that you get from God are not just for you, but for everybody that comes after you. That's why you cannot just think about yourself. The covenants that you make today can affect your generations after you. The relationships that you make can affect the generations after you. The decisions that you make can echo through eternity. So this blessing that he said, I'm making a covenant with you. It's an everlasting covenant. It will not end that I will be their God. This is the thing that gets me. We just talked about in Deuteronomy 6 how he tells them and he repeats to them. He tells them, say, hey, continue to repeat to them that the Lord our God of Israel is one. Repeat to them about how you have to love him with all your heart, your mind, and your soul. Repeat to them about how he brought you out of Egypt. Repeat to them. Repeat to them. This is the thing. God made this covenant to Abraham in Genesis. He was talking to Moses in Deuteronomy. And the reason why they forgot about him is because they forgot the repetition. It is important to understand this. That he's telling them, listen, that I will be your God forever. And there were people walking around not knowing that they had a covenant with a God because the people did not remind them. 
Are y'all hearing me? He's saying that they're from generation to generation. I will be their God. Now, this is the thing that, that, that blesses me about this the most. In verse 8, he says this. And I will give the entire land of Canaan where you now live as a foreigner to you and to your descendants. And it will be their possession forever. Hear me on this. And I'm about to, I feel like I'm getting excited about this. Because the thing is this. is He said, you may be a foreigner here, but it will be their home. You may be, it, it may be new to you, but it's going to be true to them. That, that this is the thing. You, you just barely getting this. But, but, but for them, it, it, it's going to be their home. That you are a renter and they're going to be an owner. That you are a borrower, but they're going to be a lender. That is something different. Hear me on this. He's saying that because of the covenant that you made with me, they will be better and not bitter. And this is the thing. For some of us, we have experiences because of our, our encounters with some of the past generation that, the, that, that we become bitter and not better. Oh, let me, oh okay. And this is the thing here. This is not a beat up on the generation before us thing because that's not everybody else's story. But for some of us, we resent the very things that God has placed in our life because we had a bad experience with who passed it to us. Some of y'all walked away from church because the person from a previous generation presented to you the wrong way. Some of y'all have a bad, a bad view of pastors because somebody from the previous generation passed it to you that way. Some of you never wanted to be married because of the one that you saw before you. Some of us had a bad, a, a, a bad relationship with money and finances because we have to take care of people who, for their bad financial decisions. The next generation should be better because of the decisions you make and not bitter. The people, the generation after us should desire your marriage more because they've seen you do it. That they should love God more because they've seen you do it. That they love Jesus more because they've seen you do it. That they love church more because they've seen you do it. They should be better because of us and not bitter. And for those of us in the room, because all of us are an older generation of somebody. And I want to take a moment to honor those in the previous generations before us who passed things to us the right way. That, that they pass love to us the right way. That they pass their relationship with Jesus the right way. That they pass on how we should love our family the right way. And this is the thing. If that's not your story, it can be the next generation story. You get the opportunity to change the narrative with you. See, what y'all don't know is that Abraham, Abraham's dad was an idol worshiper. And if he did not break the covenant that his dad made, the generations after him would have suffered. It can stop with you. So you can be uh, an inheritor of the promise, or you can be the one who changes the old one and makes a new one. But this is a generational church because he's a generational God. We have to be and we have to operate and we have to see us as a body, a local body of Christ, which is Blueprint Church and the kingdom body, is we have to have a next generation concern. And we have to be proactive in it. We cannot just be a reactive type of people that say, hey, we just want to come and renovate something. No, we should build it right from the ground up. That God even talks about how we should be proactive. If we throw up Joshua 24. He says this, but if you refuse, this is Joshua speaking to the people of Israel. So in Deuteronomy, they're about to go into the land and they don't get there yet. At the end of Deuteronomy, Moses dies and then Joshua is, is, is raised up. And this is the story about where they go into the promised land. And Joshua says this, but if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today who you will serve. The old saints will say it like this, choose ye this day as to whom you will serve. He said, would you prefer the gods of your ancestors served before the Euphrates? So that he was saying that, that, that the ones who worshiped idols before they had a relationship with Jehovah, will you choose them? Or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? So, 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 so will you live life the way before you knew Jesus? Will you live life the way before you had an encounter, before you knew who he was, before you were reminded of what he did? Or will you worship the gods that you see now? Or will it be anything else? He says, but as for me and my family, 
but as for me and my house. He said, I don't know about y'all jokers, but as for me and my house. Listen, listen, I'm going to be proactive in this. I don't know what you about to do. But I know about for my house. I, I, I don't know. And some of us need to start making that declaration. We're talking about being proactive. That listen, I, it does not. You can do what you want to do, baby. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. You have to make a proactive decision. That as for me. And my house, we're going to care about the, gen, the next generation. As for me and my house, this is who we're going to serve. So as we're seeing this, as we walk through these scriptures, we saw that God calls us to raise up a generation. That he calls us to make sure that, that, that we're a generational church and that he calls us to be proactive with it. And because we see that God loves the next generation and because we as a church, we love the next generation, we have to commit to it. Somebody say commit. We have to commit. And there's three commitments that as a church, that as a body, and that us in, in Blueprint in specific that we will always make to the next generation. And the first one is this, is that we will invest in the, in the future. We will invest in the next generation. Hear me on this. If you're taking notes, you should write this down. Is that we will serve, sow, and support the next generation. We will serve them. We will sow into them. And we will support them. I just said this earlier that I am a product of somebody investing in the future. That I am a product of somebody looking beyond just the members in the church but saying who's coming after this. That there's somebody, they didn't know that there was a little boy who needed a church home. They didn't know that there was a little boy who would come here that wasn't coming for Jesus. He was coming for the girls and the games. He was coming because he wanted to hoop. He was coming because he saw the basketball court and it looked pretty cool. But because he invested in that, it kept me out of other situations that I could have been in. That it is our job. It is our duty. And hear me on this. It is our privilege to invest in the next generation. I said serve. That is why I said that, that we should never have an empty children's church. We should never have people who are not serving because we want to serve the next generation. We want to be a part of Deuteronomy 6 and reminding them that the Lord our God is one. We want to sow seeds into their future. That's why we call it the garden because we believe that the seeds that we plant now are going to reap a harvest that grows forever. That will serve them. That will sow into them. I'm telling you right now, I'm a big vision type person. Blueprint is going to have a community center. We're going to have a daycare. We want to have a school because we want to sow into the future. And we're a part of that. You're a part of that. If you call Blueprint your home, if you feel called to this, it is a non-negotiable. We care about the future. We serve the future. We sow into the future and we support them. How do we support them? We show up. It, it, listen, we did family Sunday today and we shut down the garden because no matter how many kids in here, we wanted to show them and display to them what it looks like to worship together. Listen, if they can be on TikTok, they can be in big church. Amen. They sit there and have that tablet all day. They can sit in a sermon. They can experience Amazing worship. Because we don't want to just distract them. We want to deposit into them. We invest into the future. The second thing that we do is that we protect the future. This is at the heart of God that we have to protect the future. We have to protect them. And we protect them through three ways is that we pray for them, we're present, and we're persistent. Prayer, presence, and persistence. All throughout the Bible, we see that when the enemy wants to attack a generation, he goes after the children. When God is raising up something incredible, he goes after the children. Let me tell you something. We are foolish if we think that the enemy is not after our kids, we can see it in TV, we can see it in music, we can see it in any type of media, we can see it in just in the culture of the world, he's after our children. Because this is the thing, he might look at you and say, she already believe in God, but I can get a child. She already go to church, 
But if I can get her boy, she's already given her life to me. But if I can get how God says train them up in the way that they should go, he's trying to train them up in a way that they shouldn't. We see the enemy is consistently after the children. In the book of Exodus, when God was wanting to raise up Moses, we see that Pharaoh issued out an order to kill all males that were born. He said, if I can stop, he, he, he said, I stopped the future now. That King Herod, when Jesus was born, that they were worried about somebody coming and overthrowing the Roman Empire. King Herod put out there, he said, kill all boys under the age of two in all of the land. He's after the children. Ty, we got to be committed to praying for our babies. And hear me on this because I want to make a broader scope. Not just the toddlers. We should be praying for everybody who's coming after us. Pastor Donna and I can, can, can tell you if I'm lying right now. If I'm lying, I'm flying. This is the thing. I pray about the next pastor of Blueprint now. You want to know why? Yeah. Because it's the next generation. We should want things to be better after we go. We should be praying for those that come after us. You should be praying for the children. You should be praying for the high schoolers. We should be praying for the middle schoolers. We should be present with them. I can tell you this. I can't speak for other churches, but as for, this, as for our house, that babies and that these children at the garden, that the, young, that the young ones in here, they shouldn't be able to look up and not seeing people being present. They should not come in here and feel like they're the afterthought. But they're a priority. That, we pray, that we're prayerful, that we're present, and that we're persistent. Even when you walk away, you can't get rid of me. You know what? I, I, I know sometimes we be talking about them kids, we're getting on nerves. You can't get rid of me. That I'm going to love you, that I'm going to pray for you, that I'm going to continue to sow into you, that I'm going to continue to support you. Because at some point in time, you'll look up and you say, hey, they never left. I don't know about y'all, but I said that I'm a product of a church. I'm also a product of persistent prayer, prayers. I'm a product of people never giving up on me when I did not want to be in this place. Because I turned around and I saw a pastor that still loved me. I turned around and I saw a dad that said, I know you've been wilding out, but come on back home. He was persistent. We must be persistent. And the last thing is this, and I'm about to close, is that we disciple the future. And I'm not going to go too much on this because I'm teaching on discipleship next week. But I want to share this to you or share this with you. The greatest way that we can love, invest, and protect the next generation is by discipling them. And for some of us, especially in churches of our context, discipleship is very foreign. It's not something that we're used to. But let me tell you something. We're going to change that. Is that discipleship is intentionally leading, pouring into modeling, and hear me on this, and walking with those who are next. We see discipleship is just like how Moses walked with Joshua. That the only reason why Joshua knew how to lead is because Moses gave him proximity and he followed him around, just like how we saw Jesus walk with the disciples. Just like how we saw Paul walk with Timothy. We have to walk with the next generation. There's a verse in here, and it's no coincidence, hear me on this, they need us. There's a, um, it's no coincidence that God called us or called me to teach this on Father's Day. This wasn't something that I sat there and just planned out that God gave us this because fathers, we got to be discipling our children. And hear me on this here. Hear me on this. Even if you're not a dad. So for everybody, every man in here who's not a father yet, it should be your standard to disciple your children. We got to do better. We have to do better. I said it earlier. I don't know what your story was, but you can change the next story. That we can make sure that our children don't look up and say, my dad didn't disciple me. They should know how to pray because they watch you. They should know how to worship because they watch you. They should know how to provide and protect, not just fight because they watch you. The verse in here is the second most heartbreaking scripture in the entire Bible to me. They're going to throw it up. It's Judges 2 verse 10. And I read this before, but it says this after that. Hear me on this. So Deuteronomy, we talked about that God is giving instructions to Moses. 
Joshua comes after the book of Deuteronomy. And Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Judges comes right after that. It says, after that generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. There was a generation that did not know who God was. And there was a generation that did not know that he split the Red Sea to get them out of bondage. He did not know that they were crying for thirst in the desert and he had Moses speak to a rock or strike a rock and water came forth. He did not know that they were dying of hunger. And every morning when they woke up, there was man on the ground and every evening there was quail provided just for them. They did not know the promise and the covenant that he said that I'll be your God from generation to generation. They did not know that God confirmed his covenant with Abraham. They did not know that the land at the end that God said that you will be a foreigner, Abraham, but this will be their possession. They didn't know the God of Israel. Statistically speaking, even if we walk around, there's a generation right now that does not know what Jesus did for them. 40% of people in Houston claim to not have a relationship with Jesus. 75% of Christians in Houston don't have a church home. There is a generation that does not know. But we will not contribute to that. We will be a generation that when we're all gathered to our ancestors, that when we're long gone from here, that a generation look up and said, I know what my God has done for me. That somebody cared about me. That we will be like a pastor who came from West Texas to Houston, Texas. Planted a church on the north side of Houston. Saw a vision for a place created a Friday night block party did it every week put a basketball court out there just to attract the kids and a bad little kid would come up there and hoop every Friday chase around and eventually gave his life to Jesus and planted a church in Houston that now over a thousand people have given their life to Jesus because of an investment in the next generation. The seeds that you sow today will echo forever. So we're going to close this the way that we should. We're going to pray. So I want everybody to stand up. It's family Sunday. And so if you have your family with you, I want to make sure that you're if you have your children with you, if we can make sure that we're with them. And if you don't have your children with you, if you don't have children, you got family here. We're not like family. We are family. But for about a minute and a half or a minute, we're going to pray. And these are our three prayer points. We're going to pray for every family that's in here today and that's connected to us for their healing for their future and for their impact. We're going to pray for us as a church that we might change the world by how we steward the next generation. And lastly, we're just going to pray for the next generation that because of our investment in them, because of our protection, and because of our commitment to discipleship, that they might be greater and better than anything we could have imagined. We have a culture here that we say, I agree. Can we all say, I agree? Okay, come on, let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you, Father God, and let's be participators. Father, I thank you because you are the God of heaven and earth. Father, I thank you, Father God, because there is nobody like you. God, I thank you because you're wonderful, you're matchless, and you are holy. God, I thank you today because you are Jehovah. 
God, you are the amazing God. You are El Shaddai. But God, today we thank you that you are Abba. You are our Father. And so, Father, for every family that is represented in here today, whether it's a multitude or just a single person, Father, I thank you for them. And I pray, Father God, for the healing of their life. I pray, Father God, for the healing of their future. And I pray for the impact that is coming to them, Father. I thank you that you have called them for such a time as this. And their lives will be changed simply because, Father God, they decided to commit to it. Now, Father, I also thank you, Father God, and I lift up us as a church, as blueprint. God, you have called us as a church to make impact not only in this city, but in this state. And not only in this state, Father God, but in this nation. And so, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray, God, that we might do our part to bring change change to this world, Father God, that we might raise up world changers, that we might raise up politicians, Father God, that we might raise up, Father God, athletes, that we might raise up people who are world shakers, business owners, Father God, most importantly, Father God, kingdom citizens, that the people, Father God, that our church, hey, that our church, that when you look at our church and the fruit that it bears, Father God, we will not just have a big church with a lot of numbers, but we'll have children that come over out of here who love Jesus. Let us be a place that produces fruit, Father. And lastly, Father, I just pray for the next generation as a whole, whether they're connected here or not. I pray, Father God, that they might turn their heart to you. I pray that we might do our part, Father God, to invest in them. And I pray, Father God, and I even prophesy and speak and I decree and I declare, Father, that our next generation, like you said, our our latter days will be better than our former. So, Father God, what we say is this is that this latter generation, that this next generation, Father God, that it'll be better than us. God, I pray that you would do all the amazing things in our life. I pray that you would bless us in ways that we cannot imagine, that you would bring power that we cannot imagine, Father God, but more importantly, let them be better than us. I pray that our sons and our daughters would be better than us. I pray that our nieces and our nephews, Father, that they might be better than us. I pray that our grandchildren one day, that they might be better than us. I pray that the pastor of the church might might be better than us. That the congregants and the people who serve in our builders might be better than us. God, that as we go further, we go farther. And we decree and we declare that it is so. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And what do we all say? Come on, give them a shout of praise. Come on, if you love the next generation, come on, give them a shout of praise. I wish for one moment that you would lift up a praise like it would shake the shackles off of the generation that is coming after us.